So you are number one in the market five years in a row. 23 agents sold 757 homes in 2021. And one agent sold 100 homes her first year in real estate. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to sit down and bring to you my good friend, Matt Smith of Matt Smith Real Estate Group. Matt, it's cool to be with you, brother. How are you, man? Man, I'm just blessed to be here. Thank you so much for having me. You bet, man. Well, let's uh, let's dig in. I know people want the meat and potatoes, man. Uh, take us back to the beginning of this thing, where where you were at in life before you got into real estate, and then take us through it, and then get us into this operation that you're running at such a high level today. Yeah, absolutely. Be happy to. So I'm going to start before I even got into real estate. So okay. um, a lot of people look at people that are successful, right? Which in my opinion, I'm nowhere close to success. Um, success is a journey, right? You're always chasing it. But um, where I've progressed in life is just because of my mindset and because of things that I've just wanted to accomplish. And, and honestly, my life shifted when I changed on focusing on helping other people. And so I want to start with that piece. So where my life was is that I was, I grew up in a very modest family, right? Um, and in a very, very small town, my graduating class in high school had 30 kids. Um, so very small town um, and worked at my family sawmill. Um, and so for those of you who may know, a sawmill is a, it's a manual labor job, right? It's not anything that's, it's not real estate. I'll just put it that way. Um, and so that's where I learned my work ethic. And I just decided that I wanted more. I felt like I was capable of more and just wanted to continue to grow and level up in life. And so started watching videos, reading books and working on myself and improving my skill sets. And then every time an opportunity came, boom, I jumped on it, right? I don't think about it. I just, I jump, but let's see how it goes. Let's see how it happens. And, and as I progressed, I fell into real estate. And so my very first year in real estate, um, I was fortunate. I was rookie of the year for my market as a single agent, sold 74 homes my very first full year in real estate. So a lot of people will think, wow, well, what kind of market are you in? At that point in time, that was a record for anybody as a single agent in my market ever. And I did it my very first full year. Here's the <laughs> kicker. I did it with zero training, zero support, nothing. So here was my training, John, you'll get a kick out of this. So my broker at the time, my training was, hey, welcome. Um, you got your license, here's your work permit. Thanks for coming here. Here's a contract. Go ahead and read through it. I'll be back in two weeks. I'm going on vacation. <laughs> they, they came back from vacation and I said, here's five contracts. I think I filled them out. All right. Can you check them? So that was my training. Um, I just a firm believer in action wins. Take action. There was people that came in that I could help and I just talked to them and went to help them. Um, and so going through that journey, that didn't, that didn't, I kept hitting my head on the ceiling. I kept feeling like there was more that I could do. There was more that I was capable of as well as more people that I could help. And so I was at the time a, in my small market, there was, I heard teams all across was a big thing, right? This was five, six years ago and teams were kind of just kicking off. And so I thought, well, what if I could do that here? Um, and everybody laughed in my face. Well, that won't, that'll never work. That won't work here. Um, and so anyway, I, after butting heads um, with what where my future was going for my company for for the company and for my business, I decided to start my own. And so I jumped out and started my own team. Um, it's it really started with I wanted to be able to help more people. And so I had an assistant and myself and we said, let's see what happens. And so our very first full year, we, we sold 100 homes as a team. Um, we were able to get one or two agents towards the middle of the year, um, and we were just figuring it out, just grinding as we were going. The crazy part is 100 homes doesn't sound like a lot for a new team, but we started at absolute zero. At the time when I transitioned, um, the broker decided that because in our state, all the listings and contracts belong to the broker, they were going to keep those, and I wasn't going to get anything or get compensated um, for any of that. And so here I am. Um, I'm a new dad, new career, trying to start my family. And it was a decision that I, to be honest, my gut told me that was going to happen, but I really had to look myself in the mirror and say, all right, am I a fraud or do I really believe what I'm telling myself? Do I believe my own story? So I know for a fact I can help more people. And so do I need to be selfish and stay here so I don't quote unquote lose money? Or do I need to take this leap to see if I can help more people? So I took the leap. Um, and as soon as I did that, 
it's insane. My life has never been the same since. As soon as my mindset shifted and I focused on helping other people, life has never been the same. You ask me how much money I made last year, John, I don't know. Ask my CPA. I don't know because that's not what I'm focused on, right? I'm focused on the lives I'm able to impact. And so it's crazy to think just five years ago, my team was formed. And here we are this year, five years later, sold is actually, I gave you the wrong number. It's actually 766 transactions we <laughs> sold. We were ranked number 15 team in the nation last year. And in our small part of the part of the world, Inc. 5000 isn't a thing. I don't think anybody even gets the magazines here. Um, <laughs> but we were actually on the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing companies. And it really all started with just a simple mindset shift of what can I do to provide more value and help more people? Where'd that come from? Is that, uh, was it something that you were raised with from your parents? Was it as you went on this personal development, personal growth path, all the things that you were taking in and you recognized people that had success and that was the one thing they did is, is contribute. Where did this spirit of contribution come from? That would be, that would make a great story if that's how it happened, but that's not it at all. Um, how it really happened was, I don't want to go negative here, but I just saw some things that other people were doing and I did not like how it was doing it, how they were doing it. And unfortunately my hands were tied to have to be a part of that in certain situations. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, that was one of the hugest blessings of my life, being a part of people that were doing things that were unethical, um, at times illegal um, and things at the end of the day, regardless, there's right and there's wrong. They just weren't right. Mm -hmm. And so I believe what's right is right. That, so that I was taught. My mom taught me that at an early age, right? What's right is right, period. And so I always believe that. And so I just, as I was seeing, again, I said, my mindset at first, I was like, this is terrible. But again, I've got this new family to support and I've mm -hmm. got to have income to support them. So it was just a huge conflict. And then when I just went all in on, I need to do the right thing and hope everything works out. Thank God I did. And it's important too, if you guys are listening to this, understand that you blessings don't always look like blessings in your life. Mm -hmm. Blessings are hidden, right? So this terrible situation that I was in, turned out to be the biggest blessing of my life because it shifted my mindset and showed me what I did not want to become. So now I have the vision on what I did want to become. If that bad stuff wouldn't have happened, if I wouldn't have seen that, I would be nowhere close to where I am today. Well, one of the things I'm going to kind of fast forward in the question here, but it's, it is, um, you know, what I get to observe and in, in knowing you and, and seeing inside your organization. But I want to point out is that, you chose principles over money, principles over money. And that's truly probably been your shortcut. If there was a shortcut, it's principles over money. Absolutely. And I mean, business owners out there, real estate agents, that's never the easy decision. <laughs> principles over money, never. And I'm telling you, as you get bigger, it doesn't get any easier. It gets harder as you go. Mm -hmm. But um, I had a conversation with an agent about this today. And I said, at the end of the day, if you don't stand for principles, you don't stand for anything. And so what are you teaching your team, your kids, whoever it is in your life that looks up to you? Because everybody's a leader. Everybody has people that look, look up to them in life. And they are watching you even when you don't know it. And so your actions matter. It's not about what you say. It's about what you do. What are your actions doing showing the people that look up to you? Because they're watching, whether you know it or not. So true. When, uh, you know, it's like, when did the growth start? Day one, you know, <laughs> 70 plus transactions and then a hundred. But when did this thing, was it gradual or was there a defining moment where, okay, we had this massive leap where we doubled one year and yep. it was because of ABC and XYZ. Talk about that moment where you said, okay, this thing is going to go. Sure. Yeah. So there's been multiple moments, um, but the one that sticks out is when I started my first year, 74 houses as an individual agent, um, I had an infant at home. And just before that, John, you know, a little bit about my story is just before that I came from, man, it was, it was rough. I'll just put it that way. Um, we were two months behind on our electric bill. Couldn't, couldn't buy diapers or formula for my infant at home. Like, so that's where it came from. And it came from, all right, I have to make this work. Zero options, right? I have to make this work. And so 
looking back now and my, my daughter is now nine years old everything's great but there was there was a there was a time i actually had a talk with her last year and i was talking to her about do you remember when daddy first started in real estate and we were just talking and i'm going to get emotional talking about it but she was like no i don't and i'm like well here's why because you didn't see me but i want you to know here is what i was building here is what I was doing. And I feel like I owe you an apology. But now look at all this stuff that we have. Look at all these people that we're able to help. And parents out there that I'm going on a quick tangent here, John, parents out there, I want you to learn this lesson. I taught it to myself. Don't tell your kids you're going to work. Whenever you're gone all day, don't teach kids that work are, is a bad thing. You're leaving them to go to a job. No. What are you actually doing? What is your mission at that job? Every day I walk out the door, I don't tell them I'm going to work. I'm going to help people and change their lives today. Have a great day at school. Now I'm leaving and they understand why I'm not there, right? Having that conversation with them, it makes a huge difference. So one of the turning points was, um, number one, I had to make it work, right? Um, and then I just got to where I just worked so dang hard that I just, I fell down, right? I just couldn't work anymore. I couldn't wake up. It just, you know, enough was enough. 16 hours a day for two years in a row, something's got to give right um so finally i'm like there's all right let me stop and breathe for a minute what can i do differently other than just outwork everybody and so <laughs> then i actually put some thought into it and that's where the team came from right and i thought well what if i could create leverage um and actually help i think i could help more people and i could have a family life and to be honest when you're working 16 hours a day and your job as a real estate agent is i started i mean full transparency. I started real estate for the wrong reasons. I needed money. I was broke. I had bills to pay. But when I made the transition and realized there are people involved in this process, then all this, when I stepped, I fell down and I'm looking, I'm like, all right, so what can I do different? Because this is not sustainable, right? So it was one of those aha moments where if I can, I'm actually every single day, I'm dropping the ball. These clients are trusting me with this purchase or sale of real estate, and I am letting somebody down every single day because I can't do everything. And then all the self-development work that I had been doing in the background, different things, it just kept popping in my head is you can't do anything great alone. You need great people. And so I thought, let me find more people. Let me find more people that align with my values, that align with what I believe, and let's us work together, find somebody that's good at my weaknesses plug them into this, this business and see if we can actually give these people the service they deserve and serve them in a higher level. And that, that was the first aha. That was the first, wow, I did that with an assistant. They were able to manage the transactions after it was under contract, all of that stuff. And I no longer was chasing my tail every single day. I was being proactive and able to get face to face with more clients, give them better service. And then the business just started pouring in. But the, I really believe this to this day. It was, yeah, the process has worked, having the right people, the right strategy, all of that works. But if I had not shifted my mindset, if I had not said, I'm doing this for the right reasons and focusing on the right things, none of this would have happened. At, at what point do you, were you able to get out of sales? Yep. So that's uh, so. I've actually, I wrote some notes down here because I was, I was curious too. I looked back five sure. years and said, what have I, where did my transaction count? How did I get from 74 my first year to 766 this year? How did that happen? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm looking here, I've got two years where I over doubled year over year. Mm -hmm. So there was two huge years that were tremendous leaps. There was one, only one stagnant year and that was a transition, another transition period. When I had already built my team, I was under another umbrella. Um, and the same thing, they fi figured out that I, I found a better option, decided to partner with eXp Realty, use the cloud brokerage model, all the benefits that I thought would be good for me and my team. And when we transitioned, they took, we had 97 listings at that time, 97 listings. They took every single one of them. Are you kidding me? No. So I had, I'm not only did I start from zero, uh -huh. I've had to go back to zero twice now in my journey to get to where we are. Oh my goodness. So I have now I have a, my own lease. I have my, I've spent $40,000 building out my new office. I've got to buy my own lead generation, every, all my own signs, everything else starting a team thinking, oh, we've got 46 pending transactions. We've got 97 listings. I'll just be able to float this right with next month's bills. Well, they find out we're leaving. They literally, they call me to a meeting and say, you have to 5 PM, get your shit and get out. And oh, by the way, people, 
Yes. Oh, by the way, we're keeping those listings and you're not getting paid on your pendings. Good luck. Wow. So funny story on that. Karma's a bitch, right? So karma comes back around. We outsold that office three years later, like 26 to one this year. Wow. That office has virtually disappeared. So that's the best way to show people. That's right. Oh, wow. Amazing. So as you looked at, as you were moving along, um, what were your lead gen strategies and, you know, how did you from here's where we're at, we're out generating business initially. And then what were your first steps as far as lead generation is concerned? Yeah. The, so my first, when I started to go back to as an individual agent, when I first started, it was, is there's a piece of paper on the floor with somebody's name and phone number on it? I'm calling them. That was my lead, right? It was, it was anywhere. I was just scrappy. You know, I heard you said house, what you're interested. How can I help you? You know? Um, and right. so that's really where it started. But then when I got some strategy involved um, at that time, there was this cool thing called Facebook. And I saw these other businesses using it. I saw other people doing it. And um, I hadn't really done it personally because I was too busy working, right? And I thought, I think this thing could work for real estate. I really do. I hadn't seen anybody else do it. It was literally a thought I had. I'm sure I'm not the first one that thought of it. I'm sure somebody else had already mastered it. But I literally, I came up with, well, what if I could tell people through this thing called Facebook that, hey, I'm a real estate agent and I've got, I've got this house I just listed for sale. If you're interested, I can show it to you. Right. That's where it started. And then I took rocket science, huh? Right. right? <laughs> and then I took that to, oh, wait a minute. I can actually send this to the people that I want to see it. Oh, I can create hand raisers through social media. Literally, I went all in on social media. I had friends, I had family saying, Would you quit posting that stupid real estate stuff? I'm gonna unfriend you. <laughs> and I just literally told them, I said, Well, I'm not doing it for you. Unfriend me. I don't need you as a friend. Yeah. I don't need you as a friend on Facebook. I'm not talking to you. Ignore it. That's fine. But literally what happened, I remember going to the grocery store. I went to a couple auctions to try to buy investment properties. And I remember when my team was still an infant, I would take my team with me to go look at a, um, a flip house or something that I was working on a project just to get them involved. Right. So they felt a part of it. And every time I met with somebody for two years straight, they're like, wait a minute, you're the Facebook guy. Like that's what I was known as in my town for real estate. And so that's what really kicked it off is because that's word of mouth. Sure it is. So, and then of course we supplemented with realtor.com, Zillow, pay-per-click, all those other things as we scaled and, and, and have grown. But still to this day, I own a social media marketing company. That's, that's our number one. We're able to create funnels and filters where it's no longer, you're not, you're actually on social media. If you do it the right way, it takes time. You can actually target the right people with your funnels. And so you're not, it's not interruption marketing. Like all these gurus tell you, they're just trying to sell you something. If you do it the right way, you are targeting the right people and you can actually tell Facebook how many times you want them to see your message. Well, and let's, let's point something out too, because I think that hopefully people will follow you and watch what you're doing and, you know, look at, I mean, the one thing to look at is if, if someone that's really successful, like Matt is, is posting something and has a certain pattern and cadence and he's successful, um, he's probably doing it because it works. So pay close attention to it, but I want to bring something up. It was pretty neat. I think it was about six months ago, uh, a major, very respected multimedia uh, marketing company. They did an audit. What did what did they say when they audited? Because you were it was exploratory, and you know yep. you're looking at hey, how can I extend this brand out, build trust in the marketplace, create more opportunities. Um, and and I, from what I had heard, the the conversation went really well. But when they did the audit, what did they say to you? Yeah, that was a that was a pretty cool experience. I'm glad you brought that up. It was uh, so I was waiting for them to just drop the hammer right on. <laughs> hey, you need to fix this. You need to do this. You need to do this. Um, and they literally came back and said, well, we spent a lot of time diving in. We got this person involved. And then we got this person involved. And I mean, maybe you could tweak this a little bit and that a little bit, but you guys know what you're doing. We'd be doing you a disservice. You don't need to hire us. <laughs> it was pretty cool. And, and, and it's a great organ. Well, and not typical for a vendor. So we have great respect, made you respect them even more. 100%. Um, yes. Naturally, but um, what a great compliment because they're they're the real deal too. We know yes. that uh, they work with a lot of people. So yes. that's awesome. Talk about um, when did you get, I mean, you talked about leverage and, and, you know, we talk about this a lot, but when do you think you really got that? Holy smokes, because your purpose was to serve people, inspire people, impact people's lives. 
you got crystal clear on that. But when did you really, do you think you really got, holy smokes, I'm not in the transaction business. I'm not in the real estate business. I'm in the human resource, human experience. When was it? Okay, I'm not moving transactions anymore. I'm moving human beings that move transactions. When did that light bulb really hit? Was that way, way early on? You knew that's where you were going or was there a moment? No, I, I wish it was way, way early on. If you're listening to this and you're at that transition, do it yesterday. Don't wait. Um, but I'm hard headed. And so I, I just, man, I'm just a worker. And so I just kept my head down and just kept digging and just kept, kept grinding. And, um, and then one of these days I looked up and I started, my team was growing. I do have a little bit of leverage. I have a transaction coordinator. I have a few buyer's agents, but I'm still the, the source of my income. And I'm still no offense to anybody that's still on my team from back then. Cause they all worked really hard, but I wasn't going to let them outwork me. <laughs> right. And so I just thought one day I woke up again, it was a similar, it was a burnout moment. It was, to be honest at this time, it was a conversation with, with my daughter. Um, and I kept getting back in old habits and it was a, it was a slap in the face. It was a wake up call. Like, all right, you've got to get your shit together. Um, because what's actually important in life. Yes. These people need your help, but you've got great people that you can teach to leverage this. So you can actually still have a family life. Right. And so when I learned that, was I, so at the time I was team leader. I was the visionary. I was the, doing all the marketing. I was the listing agent. Um, I'd still show a buyer if they happen to call me, you know, and I mean, we were doing 250 transactions at this time. I was doing hundred by myself, you know, um, and doing all these other things. Um, and so it was, it was just really, a, I had to just set back and look and say, all right, what do I actually want and why do I want it? And so anything, Anything that's been an aha for me has been you have to pick your head up every now and then and you have to really visualize what do you want and why do you want it and who do you want it for, right? Because there's a lot more people that are imp more important to me than me in my life. And so what's important to them? And so why, what can I do to give them a better life? And so it's not always about who can work harder. Sometimes you have to work smarter. Sometimes you have to use this cool thing called leverage. And if you pour into people, your return on that versus your time is tenfold. It takes time to build that pipeline. It takes time to put your trust in those people. And it, it's not easy, but I promise you it's worth it. Because where I'm at today in my business is I'm going to sell zero units this year. Zero. My team is going to sell 1,250. And I'm going to have more free time, more family time than I've ever had in my entire life and be way more fulfilled. Because what I'm able to do now is all of those agents are now my clients and I'm able to impact their lives. And they are the ones spreading our message and our values to the clients, the communities to help them buy and sell real estate. And that feeling right there, when I said I started to help people, that feeling, you can never replace that with any amount of money. Well, and uh, how many movie room, I don't know if maybe there was even a movie room back then yet, but how, how many movie room popcorn nights with your little ones and your wife were there back then versus now? Never. <laughs> I, I, when I came home, like I had to tiptoe so I didn't wake them up, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. So now you guys have movie popcorn nights as much as you want to, right? Yes, absolutely. All the time. Yeah, we get to watch the same movie over and over again, usually, but hey, it's still fun, right? <laughs> right. It plays on, it's like, I've got this loop. You're probably singing it on the way to work. Oh, here we go. Oh my goodness. Yep. That's so good. Um, talk about um, your, your modeling right now, as far as um, ISA model, or is it more dependent on the agents doing the work? What, you know, on this trajectory up to um, uh, nearly 800 transactions, you know, what point did you bring in ISAs? Did you bring in ISAs? Where are you at? Yeah, great question. So um, every time I've told this part of the story, it blows everybody's mind. Number one, our, our sales are traditional, period. We are not partnered with this big iBuyer. We're not partnered with anybody. These are real people that we are serving every single day. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Not a big home construction, not a big foreclosure, not iBuyer. These are real sales with real people, every single one of them. Um, so that's first and foremost, but also to get to this point, we just now, John started an ISA department. We have been able to, through leadership, through coaching, through accountability, through the right people, all of this is done with our agents that all the prospecting themselves until now. What do you, so let's stop there because it's, you know, no one can predict who's going to be productive, but you chose a path 
of work ethic. I mean, agents are going to do the work. And one of the toughest things for team leaders is getting agents to do consistent lead follow-up. What would you say, uh, because listen, you didn't always get it right. You're never going to always get it right. Neither am I. Um, that's why we both got coaches, right? Um, yep. But what is it that you're looking to identify in an interview? Because yours is one of, of, of work ethic and massive commitment. That's um, naturally, when you look at per person productivity like this without ISAs, it's required. What are you looking for? Yeah, so we have a saying here. It's culture over sales, period. And that's not something that we just say. That's something we actually believe in. And so if you are starting a team, if you own a team now, if your culture isn't right, work on it every single day. Culture is a living, breathing thing. It is getting better or worse every single day, every day. And so if you are not actively working on it, and it's not just you as the team leader, the broker owner, the lead agent, it's everybody in the organization has to be bought in. So first and foremost, you have always got to be improving your culture because nobody's culture is perfect, right? John, you taught me this. You got to hire to a subculture, right? You got to hire to where you want your culture to improve because you realize it can always be better. And so what can you do to improve that culture every day? And so ours, yes, we're a family. Um, we believe in integrity, discipline. Like we have, we have values that we all abide by on the team, but we also believe that it is our responsibility to put in the work to provide the value that these families deserve. So it, we have to make sure we vet them through a series of questions and to be hired on our team, it's not easy. We, we almost make it impossible to be a part of this team, but people are still raising their hand all the time to want to be a part of it, which is just amazing. But we make it a hard barrier to entry, number one, so we can protect the culture. Not that we don't want to grow, but we want to grow the right way. We want the right people. And so the right people that don't have that work ethic, they weed themselves out before they even get to a phone interview stage because they don't follow directions. They don't take the right action steps. And so if you're not willing to follow simple directions, you're not going to make it on this team. And then we take that to another level. We ask a series of questions in very strategic ways to find out, John, how would you handle this situation? If this were to happen, what would you do? Mm -hmm. Right. And then we ask the same question in three different ways to find out yeah. no, no bullshit interview questions answers right like everybody knows you can bullshit your way through an interview we find a way and we're not perfect but we attempt to go through and find a way to find out who is john actually as a person what would he really do in this situation and why would he do that we want to find out what your values are as a person now do those values align with us and if they do you'll be a good fit for the job so talk to me about this. When you bring someone in, has, has your culture moved to a point, certainly you're the visionary and, and, and hold the, the standards and the principles. Um, is it at this point or was there a point um, where that the culture started policing itself? You brought these people in, okay? And certainly it's, it's you transferring your DNA. You know, you want them to bring their... Their, their talent and their treasures forward, but while transferring your DNA to them and as far as leadership and principles and, and how you live, was there a point or have you gotten to that point yet where now the culture polices itself? Yeah, you're the only other person besides myself that I've heard say that exact words. I've said those words for five years. Yeah, Our culture polices itself. Yeah. And so I remember, well, you know, Don, he's, he's our head of agent growth now. Sure, yeah, sure. And yeah, so yeah. I remember when I was recruiting on him to come and join the team, because Don, anybody met him has ever met him. You're his best friend, right? He's just that people person, right? And so I wanted him to be on in our company. I heard he had some hardships where he was at. And so I told him this, I said, I sat down with him. I think I had to have five lunches with that guy. He cost me a lot of money, um, but <laughs> it worked out well. Um, is that I said, Don, you don't, he asked me a question. He said, so what do we do if this lead comes in, it's a husband and the wife comes in on this profile, how do you manage that? I said, Don, I don't manage that. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, Don, we have a culture where we do what's best for the client. If I have to get involved, I will, but I don't have to because we our culture polices itself and i remember i'll tell you the story i told him when we very first started our team we had five people on the team three of them were what i love them to death but i call them giggly girls right um they were the girls that, that love to uh just go to lunch and talk about their nails and they were just that crew right <laughs> and so um love them to death don't mean any demeaning by that um they're still with us today but um why, why those type of 
of people are at lunch, usually what do they do? You could call them the gossip girls, right? But we had a strict no gossip policy. I remember a brand new agent came on the team and they took her out to lunch because that was a cool thing to do. Hey, welcome to the team. We'll take you to lunch. This new person started talking and bad mouthing about somebody that on the team that wasn't there. They stopped her in her tracks at lunch. Said, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't do that here. If you have a problem with so-and-so, I would be happy to set up a meeting and we can we can resolve this face to face. But if you want to talk about them, you need to do it to them, not about them. At that moment, when I heard that story back from lunch, this the team was three months old at this point. Like it's brand new. Whenever I heard that, I got goosebumps right now. That's the good stuff. That right there, I'm like, all right, I'm on to something. These people believe, they understand, and they care about the culture just like I do. So since that day, our culture has always policed it itself. Like I said, we don't have it perfect. We're, we're a work in progress. We're trying to make it better every single day. But you got to create buy-in from your team that it is their culture. And it is their job to protect it. Because you ask anybody that wor works here, they will say their favorite thing is the culture. Mm -hmm. They want to come work here. Literally, we are, we're on a recruiting bend. You know that we're in growth mode. Yeah. Guess where most of our recruits come from? It's friends of people that work here. Because Talk about that. Talk about that. This, is really, this is really important because it's a sticking point. And, I, and I'll say that to, to leaders uh, all the time. Hey, just so you know, here's what's going to happen. It doesn't feel, you know, were there preemptive moves that you made? Because this is, you know, there's a couple things to think about. You know, what was it that made you just let go? Because a lot of leaders, they, they don't let go, Right. Um, but then what did you do that created the condition where it wasn't the, well, you know, Matt, it feels different now. I'm not going to get as much as I used to. What did you do to make sure that didn't happen? So it did happen. You can't make it not happen. First and foremost, it's going to happen. But let me give you a shortcut to make it to where it's less of a hurt for it to happen. So number one, Team leaders, including myself, we think we can outthink our agents. So if, we just, if we just do this, they'll never know. That's that is a terrible flaw as a leader. I learned from my mistakes. You need to be transparent with your people. You have to be transparent and you have to be vulnerable, right? You have to be willing to. So as an example, when you onboarded with me before the the lunch story with the, the giggly girls, yeah. Every single one of them sat in my office face to face when I brought them on and I told them a story about things that had happened in my real estate past that I didn't align with and that I would not allow in my building and why it was important to me and what we're, our mission and what we were going to accomplish here and how we were going to help people. I painted that picture for them so they felt a part of it. And so I had to be vulnerable on things that I screwed up. Hey, I've done this wrong and I'm not doing it anymore. And you won't either if you want to be here. But if you believe in this and you understand that this is what we're doing and why we're doing it, I want you to be a part of it. And when you create that buy-in and you're willing to be vulnerable to your team and transparent about growth, because I wasn't always transparent. So I'll give you a trick on that too. But you have to be transparent with your people about where you're, where you're going with your vision and why you're going there. And most importantly, we as beings are all selfish human beings. We're all selfish. Does not right, wrong, or indifferent. It's just a fact. And so you have got to, as a leader, let them understand how this move is going to be beneficial for them. If you have not thought about how, how is the agent going to take this? How is my transaction coordinator going to take this? And how is this actually going to help them? You've got to be able to not sell them, just tell them how it's going to. And they've got to be able to see that picture. And that starts with vulnerability and transparency. Also, I think I'm very relatable as a person too. I'm just down to earth. I am who I am. Um, and I don't try to put on a show. I don't try to um, act who I'm not. I just, I'm very relatable to my people. I'm still the same guy I was that graduated from a 30 kid high school, right? Um, so transparency, there's a, there's a trick there that I used that really helped us get into our, I call it small growth now that I'm coaching with you. Um, that was nothing, right? Um, I thought I was doing something, but now I've actually learned some things. Um, so the I would go to my team in a team meeting. I had a couple agents that would approach me and say, I want to be a part of your company. Can I join? Well, I made a rule. I will not hire anybody on this team unless you guys all agree. We'll bring it up in a team meeting. We'll discuss it. I want you guys to vote. Do you think we're ready for growth? 
And when you create that, that was a risk, right? As a leader, <laughs> huge risk. But I believed in what we were doing. I believed we had the right people on the team. And so before we brought every, anybody on, everybody went around and raised their hand and said, yes, I, I'm fine with them coming on. Wow. As, long as, as long as you take them through the same process you took me through, I trust you to bring them on this team. You could have created the patients running the asylum. You know that risk, yes. right? Yes. Wow. And now has it continued to be that way or you guys yep. moved from that? Um, so we've adjusted because, I mean, we've got, we had a, um, an offsite meeting with my leadership team, team today. We've got 15 to 20 people, depending on when they pass their test, in the hopper to join. Um, so when you're joining that, when you're going that quick, um, it's, uh, you can't go one by one, hey, do you want this person? But we were very clear um, at the end of last year. Here's our, so number one, if you're planning your goals for next year, you better, you better do it three, 90 days ahead of time, right? It doesn't happen on January 1. And so when we did that, we, we were very clear with our team. Here's our vision. Here's our, here's what we're doing and why we're doing it. And part of that, we're in hyper growth mode. You guys all know what we do here is we change lives and we help people. You guys interested in helping more people? They all raise their hand, right? We give a rah rah, get everybody involved because that's what we do. We we enjoy the feeling of helping people, right? And so when we get did that, I told them, all right, so here's how we have to do it. Here's our goals. Here's what you guys all said you want to accomplish. In order to accomplish that, we need more great people so we can help more people. You guys agree? And now they're all in. And now when people come in, they're not surprised. They know what we're doing and why they're here. And the coolest thing is if you get this right, when you grow, you don't limit their opportunity, you expand it. So it was a theory I had that because I was an agent before, I remember a new agent coming in. I'm selfish, right? I'm like, oh <laughs> man, that's going to cut down on my leads. Right, right, that's right. what most agents think. What right, we have right. created, don't get me wrong, there's probably maybe a little bit of that thought in the back of the heads of sure. some of the newer agents, but the people that have been around here on this team and know what we do, what we're about, they've been around long enough, they understand the coolest part is when we bring more people in, mm -hmm. that creates more opportunity for everybody. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take away from them. It creates more opportunity. It allows them for more growth. It allows for more things for them and their family. Mm -hmm. And when you get your team to actually believe that and they recruit for you, you have, to, you have to deliver as a leader. You have to make sure you deliver. This isn't theory. You have to prove it to them, right? And to be honest, you have to prove it before they believe it. That's a big key point. You cannot expect your team to believe it's best for them if you haven't proven it to them. Prove it to them first, then they'll believe. Exactly. How do you, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I tell all of my team leaders this at first when I start working with them is, how have you kept your people from feeling intimidated by you? And, and most of them will like laugh at me and I'll say, really? So how many of them have you ever had someone leave you in the past and they told you something that happened a while ago, but they told you on their way out the door? Well, that they were intimidated. They were scared. Um, what have you done to create? And, and, and what I want hear people to hear is you have mastered safety and tension yes. not stress because stress shuts stress paralyzes a human how have you mastered safety where i can give you responsible feedback and and someone listening or watching this may think well that's simple no it's not simple because i talked to a hundred of your friends that are doing what you're doing a week <laughs> i mean sorry how, how do you work that one safety versus tension so it's it's an art it's not a science Exactly. When you're dealing with human beings, that's the hardest part for me to learn as a leader. Now I love it because it's different. I wake up and it's a new environment every day. But I used to lead as, well, I'm the leader. You need to, you need to listen to the way I teach, right? That's a <laughs> terrible way to do it. So don't do it that way. But, I tried that one back in the early days, man. That was fun. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm a very, very self-aware person and I'm good at finding holes everywhere whether it's in somebody else's business, my business, an agent, a team member, I'm, I'm a hole poker and I will help fill that hole. I, I can solve problems. And so um, I learned a long time ago uh, when I first got into sales, if you, if you can identify the problem and solve the problem, you made a sale, right? And so I just focused on how can I actually help people solve their problems? And so going back to safety with agents, it's not easy, it is not. And you have to create tension but you can't create stress. And so it is, 
like I said, it's an art, not a science. The best way that I found to do that is, I mean, in one of the ways that, and you taught me this, is self-discovery, right? If you can have them discover why it's important to them. If you come in and you hammer them on, you haven't done your KPIs, you haven't made your calls, you haven't made your conversations, it's nobody wants to be micromanaged. And that's how I used to do it because, look, I know this stuff works. Here's what I did. If you do this, this, and this, you'll be successful. So just listen to me and do it. But that that doesn't work, right? You can't make them successful. And so what you have to do is you have to paint the picture, be a vision painter as a leader. But the way to hold them accountable is to find out what's important to them and help them realize that they want it for themselves and what the missing piece is, right? What is the gap between what they're doing and what they want? So if they want to, I mean, everybody has a why. So I have one agent on my team that wanted a certain amount of money in her bank account so she could take her family to an all-inclusive beach because they've never been out of the country before. She was, she, that was her three-year plan. She had that money in the first eight months of being on the team. Uh, yes. Do you know why? Because she worked her tail off. She was willing to apply what she learned. She was a quick learner, but I didn't talk to her about how many calls are you making? I talked to her about man, it's really cold here in Missouri. I bet that beach (laughs) is looking warm right now, right? And then she's like, yeah, I'm going to the beach. It's time to put in the work because once you train them, they know what they need to do. You can't force them to be productive. And if you are the one that is the leader cracking the whip all the time, nobody will want to work with you. Don't get me wrong. I hold my people accountable. I help them accomplish their goals. And I'm on a personal mission to do that. But I want them to accomplish their goals, not my goals. As a leader, I used to want more for my people because like I said, I'm a hole finder, right? And so I could find, well, you did 50 transactions this year. You were very capable of doing 75. I want to help you get to 75, but I wanted it for me. If they don't want it, you are forcing them to do something they don't want to do. So good. Uh, You know what Matt's pointing out is it's a hidden attrition issue that happens is leaders not asking someone, you know, especially in that middle of the core area, hey, do you want to maintain where you're at and find more free time? You know, and we're talking about someone that's contributed to the experience, the culture, the feel, the values, and contributed financially. You know, it's a for-profit business for both of us. And it's okay if someone wants to do that, or do you know, hey, do they want to go from that middle tier to the top tier? Whereas I remember my good old leadership days, everyone's going to make a million. (laughs) <laughs> everyone's gonna knock a bajillion oh boy i remember called mom mom how come they won't do what i tell them to do <laughs> no <laughs> lie, Matt. yeah i mean i was similar to you my little girl had i think a couple heart surgeries at that point in time i'm a branch manager you know we've got some similar family things and challenges um uh with health issues in our past and uh you know it's like how come they won't do it Son, that's why you're called the leader and they're not the leaders. (laughs) Going, um, you look at your growth right now and um, from a a staffing perspective, and and, and I'm asked this all the time and I I like people to hear from you on it. Um, Are you, is it mentorship? Is it squad leaders? Is it sales manager? Is it a combination of both? You know, it's 12 months from today and you and I are having a conversation and the growth trajectory is unquestionable. You're going to do it. How do you see yourself leading based on, okay, I want to, you know, keep what we have, but it's, it's, a, it's a foundation for us to build on. What's this all look like? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's ever evolving, ever changing. Right. Um, and so I've learned from doing it the wrong way. Hey, I tried this. Oops, didn't work. How can we fix it? Right. And so what what's really cool in being um, and the people that are listening will know if they follow you enough is that by following John, following people that have been there and done that, worked with people in the trenches, we're giving you shortcuts. Right. The same thing doesn't work for everybody. Don't get me wrong. Like everybody's different. But listen to this and apply it. How do you think it will work for you? Right. Learn from this stuff. And so being able to learn from other people has been huge. And so we did squad leaders before we have, we have transitioned from that. And the reason that we did is because what do you, who makes a good, good squad leader for most team leaders? Well, the people that are most productive, well, they know how to follow the process. So now you're going to take your most productive people 
and force them to be leaders because if they're most productive, they're probably a great culture fit. And if you ask them, hey, would you be interested in do this? As you're as as working for you and respecting you as the leader that you are, they're not going to tell you no. They want to help the team, right? And so they're going to take away from their own personal sales so that they can be a leader for the team. Number one, they've not had proper leadership training because you as a leader probably didn't train them. Talking to myself here, right? Well, here's a here's a couple pages I've written. Good luck being a leader, right? Yeah, go, go be a mentor. Yeah. Right? You are now a mentor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so you do that. Well, now all of a sudden, now their life goes into stress and overwhelm. And then the people that they're leading are like, I can't ever get a hold of this agent. Well, then they skip over and then that agent gets mad. It's it's a it was a disaster. Um, don't get me wrong, it worked. The people made it work. I have great people on my team who made it work. But from from a looking at it a 30 30,000 foot view, I made a mistake. It was a disaster. I I dropped the ball, made the wrong call. So we've adjusted now. We have leadership positions on the team that are strictly leadership positions. They don't sell houses. They don't. Because their job is strictly to provide the best leadership, mentorship, coaching services to the agent they possibly can. You cannot be everything to all people. I'm a firm believer in life. You find everybody's got gifts. What is your gift? Go all in on that gift. You have all these gurus that say, oh, you need to work on your weaknesses. Screw that. Your weaknesses are always going to be your weaknesses. Always. <laughs> you will never enjoy it. You'll hate your life. Find what you're good at and go all in on that. So what I believe in is I bring in great people. I told you a little bit about my onboarding process. I bring in great people. And then I find what is your gift? What do you enjoy doing? What are you excelling at? What do you want to do more of? All right, great. Can we make a seat for that? Let's put you there. And what has happened is magically it's created that everybody's the right people, right? Because we hire them for the right culture. And now we put them in the right seat so they enjoy their job. They do better at their job and it provides so much better service for everybody. So our model right now is we have a, a you call it a sales manager, right? We also have a um, chief uh, chief operating officer, a COO that is kind of looking over the day to day. Um, all of these are new positions within the last six months. Um, when I do something, we just go with it. Let's see what happens, right? Um, we have an operations manager that manages the operations staff. We have a sales manager that oper manages the sales staff, and then we have another leader below me that manages everything that integrates everything together. Um, we have an ISA department. Um, and that's basically a structure, buyers, agents, listing agents, and the leadership, all the leadership positions, everybody that has anything close to being a leader or is responsible for managing and holding people accountable, they are 100% non-commission based. They are there not to sell houses. They are there to be a leader. They are there to give you as the agent better service. Because like I said, human beings, even if you have the best intentions on the planet, we're selfish. And so what happens when that $500,000 commission stunt comes across the table and you, well, I can go show that house. Now, what are you taking away from the team, from the agent, et cetera, whenever you could have been here actually leading? And at the end of the day, team leaders, I'm sorry if I offend you, but if you're a team leader right now and you are the one skimming the good leads off the top and you're cherry picking, you're not a very good leader in my opinion. If I hurt your feelings, I apologize, but it's just the truth. No, I you, don't. You. you don't apologize. I don't. It's the <laughs> truth. You're better than that, right? <laughs> your, right. Your, your team deserves better. Give yeah. them those opportunities because mm -hmm. you will never grow. You'll never get out of the hamster wheel if you don't allow and empower other people. And so you have to find a way to have your leadership be leadership. Leadership is an art. It is something I'm extremely passionate about why I'm fortunate to be in the rooms with you, John, because it's, I learn from you every day on becoming a better leader. And that's one of the things that I think a lot of people think, well, the sales is the best skill you can ever get. Leadership is leadership is a skill that will pay you for the rest of your life, not always in money, but in reward, because you are actually moving the needle for other people in their lives. And there is no replacement for that. It's really good. Here's what I want to close with. Uh, and this is impromptu. We didn't set up any special interview process. We were just going to have a chat. Um, your blink answer, the market tanks. What do you do? Oh, let's go. Can, can we make it tank tomorrow? 
<laughs> All my clients are saying that, man. It's like, let's get up, let's get through this, man. I'm done with it, right? So any shift. Why is that though? What it, it, you know, it's your peers that you sit in the rooms with. Um that's what they're all saying. Like, I'm waiting for that to happen. You know, tell people that because here's what's pretty neat too. No matter whether it's a, an individual agent that hears this or a team leader or a broker owner, what is it that, that, that um, listen, we don't wish anything negative on anyone, but, but you see it as opportunity. How come? Yeah. So any shift, change, sudden movement is the biggest opportunity in life, right? So I'll give you a quick story about that is when, when COVID happened. The world shut down while we were still in where are we figuring out what's going to happen where right we're in the midwest so we didn't shut down as much as everybody else did um but at the same point there was a time for a couple of weeks we the world shut down right the entire world even us in the midwest what was the very first thing i did i had a mandatory zoom with my team because we couldn't meet face to face and i said you guys have to be here i need you an hour i need you an hour no exceptions be there and my my speech to them was all right Here's what we're doing. I've taken our lead budget. I've taken our marketing budget. I've taken everything that I've gotten, I've taken all of our resources, and I doubled down. <laughs> everything I could buy, I bought. And if something else comes in tomorrow, I'm buying it again. Wow. I want you guys to know as your leader, I am not letting anybody off. You are not going to lose your job. We Somebody is coming out on the other side of this ahead, and it's going to be us. <laughs> and that's what we did. I doubled my lead budget twice in 2020. Went all in, pushed all chips on the table. Didn't have to let anybody off. Didn't, I mean, we started, so we pivoted to virtual open houses through 3D open house software. The first five houses we did in the first five days sold the first day we did open house. The world shut down. Everybody else is in hibernation is scared to death. I take action. I see opportunity. People still need help. So any if the market shifts, I can't wait. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Uh, last thoughts. What's, uh, what's one thing you would say to um, uh, a team leader right now, if you were to say this is, this is the best advice, no matter where you're at, you know, even if you're transitioning out of sales and you're still doing it part-time or you're a large team leader, but just something that's really principle-based that's always going to be with you as a leader that, that it, it will always be the go-to what would you say that is so there's so many um if i had to pick one i would say the most important thing is that you have to lead by principles you have your actions matter like i said earlier is that people are watching you and so you can't be the leader that says i believe in culture over sales but you leave this person that doesn't align with your culture in your company because they're a top sales agent, right? You have to lead by example. And so I, I'm going to give you two. Um, I'm going to cheat here. My second part of that is I always tell my people, all of my team, that I will never ask you to do something that I haven't done by my, already myself or that I won't do right alongside with you. And anything new that happens, I'm the first one to jump in. I'm in the trenches because I can actually help you navigate that. And I'm going to show you that this can be done. I'm not, I'm not theory. I'm not fluff. Let's do this together. Let's go. Good. Well, and, and I close with this. Um, I hope that everyone's, uh, first of all, thank you for your time. Uh, I appreciate it. And thank you for your contribution to this. And in that theme, I want to let people know too, uh, Matt, you know, had this discovery that he wanted to impact people's lives and, and so he's, he's built this business and then um, raised his hand and said that, you know, something I want to be a shortcut for others who've gone down my path. And so Matt is uh, one of my coaches. It's a privilege to um, have you as one of my coaches. A uh, second call in, <laughs> uh, I got a text message from a coaching client just saying, um, hello, this is a whole different ball game here. Already an impact on the team appreciate the accountability so uh if you're someone that's that's listening to this uh and you want to explore further uh you can go to matt.cheplacklivecoaching.com and there is a uh, a questionnaire you can fill out and have a discovery conversation with matt so 
brother, I appreciate you, man. Um, go and uh, enjoy some popcorn. We got a little popcorn eater here too. Go enjoy <laughs> some popcorn in a movie, okay? Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you.